First of all, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here and all of those of you who are at home watching us as well. We know that as caregivers, it is difficult to find time to come and spend this time together and to learn some new things. I'm a caregiver myself. I care for my parents. They live independently in Round Rock, but they're in their mid-80s. So I help take care of them so they can live independently. My partner is living with dementia as well. And so I've kind of got a triple whammy of caregiving in my world. So I know what it's like to be able to try to take this time away from our daily living of caring for those that we love. So I thank you so much for joining us here this morning. Go ahead and have a seat, folks. We're going to talk this morning about what we need to do when the time comes for us to take over. That's happening very soon with me. As I mentioned, my parents are in their 80s. They live independently, but our journey has changed. My father had a brain bleed stroke three years ago, and that changed our journey. Last year, we had four cardiac surgeries, one after the other. We've seen more of the inside of the Baylor Scott White Hospital than we want. In fact, we have told them that we want to have our own couch in the waiting room with our name on it because we certainly put our invention in it for quite a while. Our journey changed. My mother is starting to wear down from having to help take care of dad and keep the house. So our journey is getting ready to change. So that's what we're going to talk about today is what do we do when that journey changes? And one thing I want to point out and we'll talk about this this morning as well. When our journey changes, and we need to utilize some wonderful resources like in-home care, like a long-term care community. As caregivers, we should never, ever feel like we have failed. Because no one taught us how to do this stuff. No one taught us how to do wound care. No one taught us how to do transfers from a wheelchair into the bathtub. These are things that we don't know how to do, and that's okay. That's why there are so many wonderful professionals who do know that. And so these are just tools in our tool belt as caregivers. Long-term care communities, it's another tool that we can utilize. In-home care, it's another tool for us to utilize. So we should never feel less as caregivers that we can't do it all because we're not supposed to. I'm going to start this morning by allowing our panelists to introduce themselves, and then we're going to launch into what do we do when it's time for us to take charge. Good morning. Thanks for being here. I think all of us are here because we initially started as caregivers. I know I did. My father had Alzheimer's and I managed his care for five years. I then went to work for House Young Home, actually doing home care, home health and hospice. And uh, I will tell you that I realized how much I did not know about care. And it became my mission to really educate people and, and make sure they knew everything they needed to know as much as was in my power to do. Um, to help them in the journey so they had more information even beyond what my company can provide. Um, after being there for five and a half years and having a lot of people ask me about placement and working with Michael a lot, I joined him to work on the placement side and continue to do advising with him. So on to his introduction. My name is Michael Gill with Texas Senior Living Locators. I've already introduced myself, so I won't bore you again. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm V.C. Spear, and I work with the Barnett and Ludy Law Firm. Uh, we do elder law. We also help our clients to access the VA agent attendance program. And I have 30, uh, 33 years now in Medicaid experience. So we're glad to help you with that as well. Wonderful. So my little clicker, it looks like it's here. No, okay. Did it? Oh, it's it did. It's magic. You know, I'm of the age that these things to me are still magical. You know, I, I remember when we got our first microwave, I was in junior high. That was magic. I'm still fascinated by fax machines. I, it, it baffles my mind 
that I could draw something, stick it in a machine, and my exact drawing pops up on the other side of the world exactly the way I did it. Blows my mind. So you'll see me being amazed when things actually work. Donna, uh, let's start with you because you got. Rob, yes. It just, did it go back? Okay. It went three slides. What is it doing? Oh my there. goodness. There we are. Okay. That would be fabulous. Get it out of my hand so it doesn't do that again. All right. Donna, we are going to start with you because we're going to talk about when we take charge, what are our options when we still have the loved one with us before we have to make the move to another community? So I did this for a long time with Halcyon. I can see up there where it says these services are available wherever you are. So if someone is at home with you, if someone's in a community, these services follow your loved one wherever they go. I think one of the first things that happens probably to most of you is you recognize, particularly if it's a dementia diagnosis, that someone's not functioning completely well at home. Maybe they're not taking their medication. Maybe they are not eating. Uh, maybe you want them to stop driving. So the first thing you end up doing is hiring someone to come in and help. And that's where home care comes in. That's always private pay, unless you have long-term care insurance. So paying for that can be challenging. Um, I'll, in a minute, when we go to the next slide, I'll discuss the details of costs. But uh, that is the, the first thing that usually happens. So people will typically say, start for a few hours a day or a week. And then maybe somebody has a fall and they have a hospitalization and they'll come out of the hospital. They might go to skilled nursing or rehab to continue to get better. And then they need home help. So that's where if they have a nursing need, physical, occupational speech therapy that follows them at home. And that can be at home where once again, wherever home is. So services go with you. So this can be at home, but people often when they move to a community, it's still going on, right? Um, and then finally, as you're getting toward end of life, I do want to devote a second to hospice, so more than one second, um, is that it is a really underutilized benefit and everyone earns it. Medicare pays for an insurance home health and for hospice. Um, it is often... People think of it, if you think back in the day, I remember when I was a kid and in the 70s, someone would have cancer and you heard they went on hospice and they died within a couple of days. And so I think certainly a lot of our seniors still think of that as being hospice. That's not hospice anymore. It's, I call it a medical benefit that offers a tremendous amount of support for families. Uh, the families who end up having someone, you obviously have to qualify. That's a lot of detail I won't go into here. But I do want to encourage you to not be afraid of that. It's a it's a part of the service line in taking care of seniors. And um, I, I can't tell you how many people kind of dragged their heels a little bit on getting a family member uh, admitted to hospice when they did. They would call me and say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I didn't do this sooner given that there was a qualification. So those can be anywhere. The last two above me are once again paid for by insurance and Medicare. If someone has a Medicare Advantage plan, there's gonna be a hospice benefit involved in that. So the only one we're really looking at for private pay there is the home care piece. All right, so let's talk about cost. Yeah, the, the big elephant in the room, how much does this cost us? So a few years ago, I was presenting somewhere and I, in my mind, um, you know, I was, people were calling me to get care and they'd be saying, oh my gosh, mom now needs 12 hours a day. This is so expensive. I'm paying X amount of dollars. What are my options? Should I move? And it occurred to me that if you could see it in a line graph form, if you'll see there, the green line, and I know it's probably pretty tiny for y'all, but I did this based on um, what most companies, home care companies do in town is they do blocks of shifts. So four hours is a typical block. So what I did was I started at the lowest. If you had one four-hour block a week 
And average care now is about $35 an hour. And I will tell you that's average. Some companies are a little less, some are a little more, depends on where you're located. My side story is my husband said in retirement, he wanted to move to the lake. And I said, we are never moving to the lake because we will be paying $45 an hour for care. I mean, you can't get caregivers to go out there. So his, his dream will never be a reality, sadly. Um, so you have to consider those things. I will tell you if you're outlying, you're going to pay more because, um, it's, it's just going to cost you. So 35 is an average, but so you start down, you know, if you're doing once a week and I would have a lot of clients who would do once a week and that's, you know, around $560 a week, um, a month. Okay. And then you start going up, you know, you add three, four hour shifts a week, you're over a thousand dollars then. Now, when you're looking at fixed income, so maybe mom or dad's, the house is paid off. They have social security, maybe a retirement. You know, they have investments, maybe they're getting RMDs out of that. But let's say, you know, their monthly income is $4,000 a month. Imagine how quickly that gets eaten up with care. So if you look, that green line starts adding as you go to 80 hours a week, 112 hours a week, um, Finally, when you get to 12 hours a day or you get to 24 hours a day. So if you're at 24 hours a day, well, let's start with 12 a day. You're paying about $11,000 a month. If you have long-term care insurance, that will contribute, but it will not pay that much. I mean, I some of the best policies will maybe cover half of that. So it is a great resource. I'm not saying if you have a long-term care policy, yay, you know, let's hope it has that. They don't all have a home care benefit. But then you get to 24-7. So you see the blue and the, the yellow lines. The blue line is the average cost of assisted living to pay average. So I put together, and you'll see in a minute, Michael's slides have, you know, where you start and where you end up in care. So I just did literally added those two divided in half. So I went with $7,000 for assisted living as an, as an average cost. Can be a little less, can be a little more, but that's the blue line. And then the yellow line is memory care. And I went with, I think it's 8,400 or something. So what you see is where that green line crosses, the, the blue and the yellow, you've all, you've hit this threshold that it might be a good idea to be placed somewhere. Because number one, you're probably experiencing caregiver burnout if you're needing that much care for someone. And, and there's, you can save a lot of money. It's already expensive, right? But I can tell you, there are people in town, there are quite a few people among all the home care agencies. You would be surprised at how many people have 12 or 24 hours a day of care. It's shocking. Uh, but I would say generally most of us can't afford that. I mean, if you're looking at you know, $20,000 a month, that's, that's over a hundred thousand a year. So, um, well over a hundred, yeah, 200. So, um, yeah, so you have to, so that's where placement comes in, right? And what Rob was talking about was, um, the statistics are rather grim on the health of caregivers, people who are caring for their loved ones. And we would say, in my experience with with people in communities and in placement, and I would say, and Michael's as well, is people tend to thrive in communities. So if you think you don't want to move them from a cost perspective, number one, it makes sense. But number two, they 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 do thrive. They get, they're around more people. And being at home is lonely, you know, and it's hard on you. So you may have a whole group of family that comes in and helps with your loved one, you know, it's just, it's not the same. It's great, but there are hours of the day that person's alone. So there's a benefit to doing that. So um, when it comes to cost, uh, placement makes sense. And as Rob said, we do a lot of educating because I think a lot of people that I've talked to today, I would say have said they're past sort of the guilt feeling of it. They're like, no, I needed to do this. I feel good about it. There are, there's still residual guilt sometimes for placing someone. Our mom said, I, I never want to go into quote a nursing home. And what Michael's going to talk about is that's, that doesn't have to be the case. Senior living has changed dramatically. 
So we want to, um, you, you want to consider what's best for you, what's best for your loved one, what your budget will allow. And often the community placement is the best thing from a cost perspective. And as you mentioned also, it's so helpful for your loved one. You know, we want what's best for our loved one. And a lot of times keeping them at home is best for us, but not for them. And so just from the point of the isolation alone, you know, before COVID, the CDC said that isolation was such an uh, at such a level of concern for older adults that it was the physical equivalent of smoking a pack of marble reds every day. That's how quickly it breaks down your body. And when you are in a community, in a long-term care community, you have so many opportunities for socialization. And so for that reason alone, it makes sense. So Michael, we're gonna to pass to you and let's talk about the big question people always ask, when do I know it's time to make them? I think uh, one of the things I would point out is that there are trade-offs to anything you do. Staying at home is great, moving is great at certain parts of, the li uh, of your life. And the house can be a gilded cage for people who are pretty far along in uh, uh, their journey and they don't get enough socialization. But the house has other options as well. And that's why we want to make sure that you understand there are trade offs. And wherever you are, uh, most of uh, we as professionals are here just to support you in your journey. Now, there are times, though, when I feel it's mandatory to move. There's one thing I don't think I, I don't want to negotiate with anybody, and that's safety. If you're not safe at home, you need to go someplace where you are. And so I have three rules when it's mandatory to move. The first one is when you're danger to yourself or others. Now, a lot of the time, this is when people are further along their journey. A lot sometimes it's when dementia is kicking in. So if you're danger to yourself, that may be you are wandering outside the house and uh, getting lost. It could mean that you're leaving the water in the uh, in the bathtub on. It could mean that you're leaving the stove on or something like that. So if you're a danger to yourself, you definitely have to. Second reason you need to move, though, is if you need healthier someplace else. And that's a little bit more subtle. And that's usually with somebody who's living alone. So you may be healthier living someplace else if you're not taking your medications properly. And believe me, I get, uh, get calls not infrequently of somebody who's taking their medications five times in a row because they forgot they took them and they end up in the hospital uh, uh, with an overdose. So uh, that's one reason that you're not safe, uh, not as healthy at home. And another reason is, uh, Rob has mentioned, is the isolation. Isolation can uh, hasten somebody's dementia. And so that's another reason uh, why you want to move. The third reason you have to move, though, is where there are caregivers. Now, that can take a couple of different forms. Number one, it could be that the uh, uh, children taking care of their uh, aging parent doesn't have enough money to pay for more than four hours of care a day, and now they need eight or ten hours of care a day because they're not safe alone without supervision. Another reason could be an 85-year-old spouse taking care of uh, uh, their spouse, and they can no longer safely take care of them because their own medical impairments. And a third reason could be if you're out in a rural area, it's catastrophic if a caregiver doesn't show up, and you don't have an agency to do the caregiving where there would be a backup person coming on in the community, and your normal caregiver has a sick child, for example, and if they can't show up for a day or two, you know, that could be catastrophic as well. So those are the three, three reasons that you can't really negotiate with things. Now there are, uh, but everybody moves uh, for their own reason, and often they move for other reasons. Socialization is one reason where, uh, and a senior themselves may decide to pull the trigger and move. But what I see for caregivers is that there are other reasons. Number one reason is incontinence. Everybody's got their own line in the sand. Uh, women are a little bit more generous about giving caregiving in this regard, but sometimes it's bowel incontinence, sometimes it's bladder incontinence, and everybody says, you know, no, I'm done. I don't want to do that for my spouse or my uh, parent. A second reason why people uh, end up uh, moving is because of sleep. 
it's not uh, uncommon that somebody with uh, dementia, for example, would get up in the middle of the night and rummage around and turn on all, all the lights because they have uh, time dysphoria and they don't realize it's one in the morning, they think it's one in the afternoon. So they're up and doing stuff. That wakes up their caregiver. Or they're constantly getting up to go to the bathroom and they are followers. And so uh, the caregiver feels the need to get up and help. I don't know about you guys, but when my kids were little, I could get up two, night, uh, two times a night and still make it to work and be okay. But the third time, I was basket case the next day. Everybody you know, has a problem. And when you get older, sleep is an issue. A lot of people can't go back to sleep. So sleep is another issue. Mobility is another reason why people end up moving. Because uh, if somebody falls, they may not be able to get them off the ground. And by the way, you can call the fire department and they will come in and help. And by the way, there are people who are frequent flyers and will have the fire department over three times a week. They don't prefer that, but they will do that. But uh, sometimes people just need help too often from uh, the uh, couch to the bathroom or something like that. And that become, those type of fall and mobility issues become another reason why people just, just to uh, pull the ripcord and say, I'm done, that's enough. There's also what I've called general overload. So, and you know, a lot of what I'm talking about here when you have to move ends up being further along the journey and often dementia is involved, but not always. But in a dementia case, for example, I see a lot of times when a, uh, a, a spouse cannot be out of uh, sight of uh, their loved one. And I'm talking about the spouse with dementia because they've got so much anxiety, they're not sure what's going on around them. And so they need to have their touchstone. And so they need to be within six feet of their loved one at all times. That means that you can't even go to the bathroom and have the door closed because they need to see you. Or if you go on out, they're waiting by the, uh, the door, almost like a, a dog or a cat waiting for you to come on back. That, that's the general sense of overwhelm. And I do have, uh, and this is a bit redundant uh, up here on the screen, caregiver health. So caregiver health is some, uh, something too. The one thing about dementia or about old age, you don't want it to kill two people. Uh, you know, and there are statistics that caregivers will die uh, much younger, as much as 10 years younger, um, when it's overwhelmed. So these are the reasons that people do end up moving, but there are the, um, the mandatory reasons as well. Yeah, statistically, 30% of all caregivers pass away before the person they care for if they do not get any help. And that's why I applaud you guys for being here because you're not in that statistic. You're actually doing something to learn how to care for the person that you love. When the caregiver becomes 70 years or older, that statistic jumps to 80% of them will pass away. That's a big concern for us at Age of Central Texas because you think about all of the ladies out in the rural areas caring for their husband who has dementia and they're like, oh, I got this, I'm fine. No, they're not. What happens if they get sick, if they pass away, and there's nobody left to care for the husband or vice versa? So it is a real thing to be concerned about. We need to be concerned about our health as caregivers. The old adage of put your oxygen mask on first and then help the person that you care for really applies for us as caregivers. It is not being selfish. It is being realistic. So let's talk about the big question, how much does all of this cost? If we're going to move to a long-term care community, how much are we looking at spending? The first thing to recognize about moving to a long-term care community is that uh, most of the cases, except in a nursing home on Medicaid, it's all private pay. And so it gets darn expensive. Um, I'm going to talk about four different levels of uh, care, and I'm going to start with sort of the two uh, higher levels, if you will, the skilled nursing and the memory care. Skilled nursing these days, uh, skilled nursing charges on a per day basis typically, and usually if you're paying privately, it's $200 a day and up, which is $6,000 a month. And so when I say end up, what I usually would get you would be a shared room. If you get a private room, that's closer to $300 a day or $9,000 a month. And the most expensive places in town are the more upscale places like Corencio or Westminster. And those can be as much as $500 a day or $15,000 a month in a skilled nursing home. Skilled nursing is the only place that accepts uh, Medicaid in the uh, Austin area. And so BC will be talking about that 
But I just want to give you that general thought of most of the time it's about six thousand dollars for a shared room, nine thousand for a private room, and it can get much more expensive as well from there. Memory care is a type of assisted living where you also have an additional certification to have a lock in the front door, and you generally have twice as many caregivers in memory care as you do in, uh, in assisted living. It is generally more expensive than assisted living. Uh, for a number of reasons, but among one of which is that memory care tends to be all-inclusive pricing, okay? Assisted living usually has a, a base price and then expert for levels of care. Memory care tends to be, and I say tends because everybody's a little bit different, but probably 60 to 70% of the places are all-inclusive. In, in Austin, the average price for a shared room these days is a little bit about $5,000 Average price for a private room is somewhere between 6,000 and 6,500. This has gone up significantly over the last uh, uh, 18 months as inflation has kicked in. There are places that have raised the prices anywhere from uh, six to about 13%. Uh, so that has been a big cost and an increase. Also Don, I think you'd agree that uh, the prices for uh, caregivers has gone up. Before the pandemic, I think we were paying about 26 to $28 up to $35 to $40 even for the private caregivers. So just a note on inflation, it's uh, hit a lot of people. Let's move to the next slide just for the uh, uh, assisted living and independent living. Assisted living, we'll hear statistics nationwide that the average cost of assisted living is $4,500 nationwide. That depends on which state you're in. It's the cheapest in Missouri for some reason, where it's somewhere around $3,200, and the most expensive places would be on the coast, coasts in California and New York, uh, where it's over $7,000. But average $4,500 across uh, the country. Here in Austin, I would say that's a little bit on the low side. It's always hard to get uh, cast iron statistics, because in assisted living, what happens is, as I say, you have a base price for the real estate, and uh, that, the base price includes uh, three meals a day and utilities. But when you need extra levels of care, it goes up. Generally, uh, the levels of care start at about $500, and they cap out at about $2,500. So if you're in a one-bedroom apartment at $5,000 a month, uh, you're going to have to add maybe $1,200, I would guess, would be about the average price uh, for caregiver. And then uh, that would top out at about 70, uh, so that'd be 6,200 for an average, and then top out around uh, 7,500. That's a little bit on the, uh, the high end, but it gives you an idea. In a memory care, you have shared rooms. In assisted living, it's rare that I see private, uh, that I see shared rooms. The cheapest shared rooms that I see these days are about $3,000 a month at, at a larger assisted living. In the smaller personal care homes, 3,000 is pretty much rock bottom you know, with services. For a couple, if anybody's thinking about a couple going on into assisted living, because there are some uh, economies of scale because you're sharing the same real estate, there's, you still have to pay extra for both people in a couple uh, for their uh, levels of care. It's really hard to uh, have a couple in assisted living for less than $7,000, $7,500 a month, rock bottom, and it goes up from there. Just for a, and this is, I'm just trying to give you order of magnitude. In independent living, uh, the cheapest independent living studio apartments these days are about $2,300 a month. The cheapest one bedrooms are just south of $3,000 a month. I would say for one bedroom, the median uh, cost around town is probably about $3,800 a month. And there are some two bedroom apartments in, uh, in um, uh, independent living. They generally start around uh, $3,800 a month and they go up to as much as about $9,000 in independent living. But the median is probably in the high 4,000 range, 4,800 or so. Um, and let's see, I think that oh, there are other costs that we have to mention too. Anytime you move into a senior living uh, facility, there is a community fee. The average community fee, it's a one-time charge up front that is non-refundable, it's about $2,500 a month. And then if there's two people in a uh, community, uh, in a, the same room, uh, there's always an $800 fee to the second set of meals, basically. And that's uh, true in both independent living and assisted living. But that gives you a general idea uh, of what the costs are. Um, last thing is in independent living, you can also get care. You would get care from the outside agency. Halcyon, for example, is in a number of uh, communities around uh, town. 
The one thing to remember about uh, care costs in an independent living community is that they're lower than they are at home because you can get them in smaller increments because they are in the building and there's as much friction in moving from client to client as there would be at a, in a house. So you can get extra care costs, but those care costs often are forty dollars an hour, but they can break them up sometimes into as little as fifteen minute increments. So that's the general concept and overview of how much it costs to be in a system. Now, uh, sticker shock, isn't it? <laughs> But let's talk about ways that we can help offset some of these costs. Uh, we're going to turn to VC, and we have talked about Medicaid this morning. VC, before we start on the slide, let's talk very briefly. What is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Medicare is your federal program for individuals attaining age 65 or those with disability. And it's a, like I say, it's a federal program. Those that are aged or disabled um, have that available to them. But that's sort of contingent on like social security with your work history and all. You have to, uh, to be able to uh, work at least 30 quarters, I believe, to be able to get Medicare unless you have a spouse that has access to their account and then possibly you can get it at that time. Um, everything is uh, sort of negotiable in Medicare as you can uh, accept the uh, Medicare program, which is like an 80-20. You have to pay 20% of the expenses or you can also add a Medicare supplement you can go on managed care programs, so you need to talk with a competent um, insurance person to help you with that. I am not that person. Uh, Medicaid is the state program, and every state has their own state plan, and uh, we have to uh, be um, totally in conformity with each state, and uh, you can uh, only you get the Medicaid program when you meet all of the qualifications. And the qualifications are that you have to have a medical need for 24-hour care. You also have to meet the financial guidelines. And typically, an individual can only have $2,000 in total assets to qualify for Medicaid. You do have some exemptions. Your home is exempt, but if you're an individual, there's a cap on the market value of $688,000 in that equity. If you uh, are a spousal case, where that means where you have a couple, one is healthy and one is ne needs 24-hour care, then we have a, a lot of rules and, and a lot of benefits for that family in those situations. Typically, you can uh, you know you split the the asset level in half typically, and then you can save half for the uh, the one in the community, the spouse in the community. But you have to spend down the half for the uh, spouse in the nursing facility. Well, there are many ways that you can do that, and so if you need to find out about eligibility for those programs is incredibly uh, complicated, but we would be glad at our, at our firm to sit down with you. We do a, a, a free consult with every family because this is something that you can't read about and understand. You can't listen to your friends tell you about the program, but I worked in policy when I worked for Medicaid. For 20 years, I worked with Medicaid doing eligibility and subsequently worked in the policy where we actually made the rules. And uh, you have to have someone that knows what the rules are. Don't listen to anyone. Come in and we do a free consult. Come and get the real rules so that you know what to do and don't do anything until you get there. <laughs> don't start giving things away or or making transfers or trying to hide money because in the computer age, everything can be found. So you, you make your pledge, 
when you come in that I'm telling you the truth because there are uh, real problems with fraud when you don't do that. But uh, I have this little guide here that says the minimum amount of the for the community's spouse. So if you had a situation where you had a couple, one was needing care, and their total assets were below 29724 that they don't have to spend down anything. That is the minimum amount that we um, are able to allow the spouse to keep, the community spouse. And then there is a maximum amount that the state allows of 148620 Well, this is sort of a complicated number, because there are Medicaid qualifying annuities that can spin down and meet the requirements for that. But once more, it's a very complicated situation. So come in and meet with our team and, uh, and get all of the information and make a plan that'll work for you. Um, we and, and just to be clear here, Medicare, does not pay for long-term care community. Typically, if you have had a qualifying um, hospital stay, you can get some day. Who knows how many? Because if you're on a, on a managed care program, you're going to be very limited. If you're on regular Medicare, you get 20 days. If you have a Medicare supplement, you may get up to 100 days, but it depends on, you know, how your um, recovery is going. If you quit taking PT because you don't want to, then Medicaid can, uh, Medicare can stop the benefits then. And so uh, sometimes families have the experience and they realize that their family member is not going to make progress. And so we're looking at a permanent day. And that's when a lot of times they come to us and say, what can we do now? What can we do now? We don't have enough money to pay $9,000 a month. And uh, from that uh, aspect, then we have to look at other sources. And Medicaid is actually a, a great source to care for our family. And that's what it was uh, that's why we have Medicaid. And like I say, I worked in Medicaid many years. And I worked as an eligibility worker back when we went to our nursing homes and we met our clients and we, we visited with our family. And, and let me tell you, that's when you first encounter angels here on earth are those people that care for our seniors. They are very qualified and, and very committed to caring for those individuals. So, you know, don't immediately say my, my family member is not going to a nursing home because I've been in hundreds and hundreds of nursing homes and I see people, I have clients that live there six and seven years. That speaks well for the care that they're receiving there. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the pandemic was uh, a bit of a problem for uh, getting staffing up to par, but I think they're trying to recover that at this time. But, uh, you know, they're cheerful places. They have people that love to be there and, and love to care for these individuals. And uh, you, you have to go before you form an opinion. You know, go there. Don't don't listen to someone else. And, and sometimes, you know, grandma might get whiny and say things happen that don't, you know, show up, find out what's going on. I think they're lovely places, personally. And as Mike pointed out, you know, the concept that we had growing up of a nursing home doesn't really exist anymore. Our industry has changed so much and has grown so much that I know folks who their mom thinks that they're on a cruise ship and they don't realize that they're actually in a skilled nursing community. 
So, Absolutely. so one of our options is Medicaid. It's a very complicated process to get onto. Medicare is not going to pay if we decide we're going to move mom tomorrow over to a nursing community and Medicare is going to pay for it. No, that won't happen. So Medicaid is an option, but it is a needs based based on financials. And then for those who serve, you have veterans as an option as well. Yes, you must uh, meet the requirements. You must have served during a declared wartime. And there are, are like a couple of sets of dates for the Vietnam era. And when you had boots on the ground in Vietnam, you have a greater length of time of, of, to qualify than if you just served during the war. So we kind of have to look at that. And you have to have served at least 90 days of active duty and better than a dishonorable discharge to qualify there on, on your veteran status. And then you, um, again, you have financial requirements. And typically, we just do the aid and attendance program in our uh, firm. There are some disability programs. We don't do that. But we can help you. Uh, that's a great source of income to help you to either um, get care at home, but you have to look at everything uh, prospectively in that you have to be receiving the care at the time that you apply. You can't be sitting at home thinking about moving to assisted living to, uh, to get the benefit. You've got to have out-of-pocket medical expenses and ideally they have to be equal to or greater than your income. You also have uh, resource requirements now. They changed that. So you do have to, they stay here on our chart, 150538 But that does include a year of income. So you have to take that off and then see what your remaining assets are. There are options for this. Um, you can take your assets, put them into an irrevocable trust, wait three years, and then there, you're past the look back for the asset requirement. So that's something you kind of need to plan ahead for. And, and of course, uh, that would also enable you to uh, have the Medicaid benefits after a five-year look back. So, you know, if we're planning people, that's a good thing. So let's let's go back to that. So we often hear, oh, I'll just go on Medicaid and I'll spend down. And or I'll give all the assets away to the kids and then I can show that I don't have anything. But that doesn't really work, does it? Uh, no, no. <laughs> you have penalties for any gifting that you might do and anything that you uh, remove from, from your access is called gifting. And uh, so right now, the um, I think they're supposed to go up this year on this, but the uh, for every $273.93 that you gift, it's a one-day penalty for our, the nursing facility, which means that you have to, you have to pay back. And typically, if you average it out, you end up, if I, if I took all of my assets and put them into a trust, I could protect about 60% of those assets, but I would pay my penalty in paying help pay for my care for a specific length of time. But that's an option. You know, that's certainly an option. It's better than paying all of it. So you do come up with that. And, and I never heard any of my seniors tell me, I worked hard all my life and saved all my money for the nursing home. They always wanted to leave something behind for their family members. And that would enable you to do that. And as you mentioned, there is a look back. So five years look back on the Medicaid program. 
And another thing to realize is that, as you mentioned, Medicaid is a state program. Yeah. So what works in Texas does not work in Oklahoma and does not work in California. So if you are a long-term caregiver with a family member who is not here, but you're going to move them here, be aware that it's going to be a whole different set of rules when they get here. The same applies to Medicare. We have this almost daily. We have people calling our resource information center that I moved mom here from California, took her to the doctor. The doctor doesn't take her Medicare. Yeah, Texas has its own Medicare. We're not part of the federal program. So mom has to start over on her Medicare when she gets here. So be aware of that. If you've got loved ones that you are moving to Texas from somewhere else, their Medicare is not going to work here as soon as they set foot here. Exactly. Exactly. You have to be a Texas resident to receive any kind of Medicaid benefit. So you can't say I'm living in uh, Louisiana right now, but I'm going to be, I want to go ahead and get my Medicaid in Texas. Well, that doesn't happen. You have to be a resident of Texas before you can get the Medicaid here. So you have to end the program in Louisiana and start a new program in Texas. All right. We threw a lot at you guys, didn't we? So let's take some questions. Let's, let's help you out. I am coming to you with the microphone. Good morning. I am the sole caregiver for my mother, who it has dementia. She's still living at home alone, um, and I go over several times a week. We have tried to get her to sign a power of attorney, and she absolutely refuses to. And I don't know what to do when it's time for her to like leave her home, and I don't have the authority. I don't have the power to do that or to even to make health decisions for her when she can't. Well, um, <laughs> the uh, the power of attorney, even if you have the durable power of attorney, is for finance. The medical power of attorney does not actually give you the ability to go in there and move them. It gives you the ability to make medical decisions for them in the event they are unable. But they do have to be able to know what they're signing to get those documents. So we need to be everyone's first stop. Have the, have the capability to take care of your family member in those respects. Because if you can't pay for the caregiver, you can't get care. So you need the financial, you need the medical powers of attorney. So she she has refused to sign everything. She has refused to sign anything. Has her, doctor, done, her doctor has already said that she cannot sign final legal documents. Well, her doctor doesn't make that decision. That's why lawyers do the powers of attorney. But if so, she can he says that she doesn't have the mental capability to know what she's signing. Well, I work with Keith most of the time and Keith sits down and talks to them in a room without the family prompting them. And he asks them questions. He asks them about their situation and he asks them if they want to have someone to help them with these situations. And it's amazing how many times they have confidence in him and they have the awareness and they can tell him what they want to do. So don't discard that until you actually have, you know, uh, the opportunity to have her meet with an attorney. And, and he is so kind and so compassionate and loves what he does every day. And he is, is so kind with them and gives them actually the comfort of being able to talk to him very freely. So you might try that. You know, as caregivers also, a lot of times the way we help, we spend things. I'm going to come to you all in just a second. It's the way we spend things to the person that we're caring for. 
as the caregiver, it's me being the son, telling mom and dad, you should do this, you should do that, as the, the spouse saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, doesn't always work, right? So sometimes you need that third party in the case of maybe taking her saying, mom, we're going to go and visit with a lawyer because I want you to have what you want. And so I'm going to take you to the lawyer. You're going to talk to the lawyer. I'm not going to be in the room. And you can talk freely to the lawyer about what you want because I want to make sure you get what you want. In my case with dad, he has been a car guy all his life. He owned a Chevrolet dealership. He has a car bed sitting in his garage. When he had his brain bleed stroke, I did not want him anywhere near that car because I knew that he could not drive well. But if I told him, Dad, you can't drive, that would not happen. So I used his neurologist as my ally in this. And when we went for the checkup, I told the neurologist, I want you to tell him he cannot drive right now. Give him that light at the end of the tunnel, but tell him right now. Say, I don't think your reaction time is good. Let's let you get better. Then we'll talk about it. Because it came from the doctor, he listened. And so giving them the opportunity to talk to somebody who's that professional, you know, you talk about the doctor. Sometimes those are great allies as to the minister, the best friend. Use those third parties to help you in this caregiving journey so that you can best protect their interests. Because that's what where our job is as caregivers, is to make sure that they continue with what they want, respect them to continue with what they want. We've got one question from online. I'm going to jump to that one real quick. But Donna had something she wanted to add as well. It's kind of echoing what you said, that it's, it's kind of the spin that you do as well. And our seniors, especially if they have dementia, they're feeling really out of control. So if we could possibly find a way to step in their shoes and say, I am not taking control away from you, mom. And by the way, that's a wonderful option for Keith to do that because you need somebody to come in and say, we're not taking over your life. We're just adding to this and, and making sure you have help when the time comes. We know you don't need it now. And while we're talking about how to manage the spin, sorry to call it the spin, but there's a term in this industry called therapeutic fibbing. And I want to make sure y'all all know that. And you may have heard of it, but there's a lot of people when we're dealing with these kinds of issues, it's, oh my gosh, but I'm lying to my mom or my dad. Or remember that this is, I, I used to teach young children. It's, it's like the, the older version of a processing issue. And they're not processing things in the same way. So we we do have to kind of stretch what we would consider the truth, but remember that they're not logical. They're not functioning on the logical plane. So as we discuss all these things, keep that in mind and, and try to take that guilt off of you because there are things that need to happen for their benefit and they just can't recognize that anymore. So it's okay to what in our version we're saying is the little white lie. It really is. There's a whole papers and research done on this concept of therapeutic fibbing. So it's okay. Um, but yes, ask for help and you spin it a different way to hopefully get that to happen. Okay, these are both for VC. Um, can my parents gift me money? And I not spend it knowing if they need to apply for Medicaid in the next five years, then I will, of course, use it regarding Medicaid five year look back. And it is it if it is longer than five years then I assume I could keep it. Well, you probably can. Uh, you know, you have to look at ethics, too. Do your parents uh, actually want to give it to you? Or are you doing that for a financial reason? Um, you know, they can do that. That is the beauty of having an irrevocable trust is that you can put their assets in that trust and have a trustee that's bound by law to use the money in an ethical manner. That is a much better situation than just turning it out and someone deciding they want to go to Las Vegas because they feel lucky today. So, you know, it's an option. It's not, in my book, a viable option. So, uh, but 
like I say, you know, come and talk to us. All right, I had a question right over here. Wouldn't her mother be eligible for a medical examination to be found mentally incapacitated and therefore eligible to be placed under guardianship with her as the guardian of the person? Uh, if you haven't been through a guardianship, and we do not do guardianships in our firm, um, it is um, it is not a good situation. It's a lifelong um, plan of mother may I. Uh, guardianships require you to go to court to spend any of the assets when there is a guardianship. Yes, they do. I worked as the county it was the county attorney, and we had to schedule some of them monthly for them to go to the judge to get permission, and you have to have an attorney to spend the money. So, um, you know, a guardianship means that the judge has to come in and declare them incompetent. You can, uh, there's just so many other better things to do if, you know, if you have the like I say, if you have the financial power of attorney, you can help with their um, with their financial assets. If you have the medical power of attorney and they are unable to make their medical decisions, then you have that capability, and you don't need the guardianship. But but that's a, a very expensive thing to do. In all the families I ever saw that had to do a guardianship for their loved one told me that that judge standing in front of their family member declaring them incompetent was the worst moment of their life. So I, uh, you know, I realized they have to do that on occasion. And a lot of times it's because of an accident or an illness. But uh, to me, that was never an option for any of my family members. Fortunately, we had, a, a, because of, of education, we had the ability to take care of the legal aspects of it and didn't require a guardianship for, for my parents. We have a question over here. Two questions, actually. We thought we heard you say that the community fee is $2,500 a month. When they go and the other question is that i see the two bedroom options so if you have a couple moving into initially independent living when would you recommend like one bedroom versus two bedroom the community fee averages about twenty five hundred dollars a month across uh one time, one, 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 yeah. sorry, one one time thing yes. uh, across uh, uh, the area hold it up closer to your mouth that better? that's better thank you Community fee average is twenty five hundred dollars a month. I mean twenty five hundred dollars one time. It is not refundable. It can be as high as one month's rent at some of the more upscale places. Uh, you know, some people are two thousand. Most places about twenty five hundred goes up to about three thousand or three five hundred. Um, what would I recommend a one bedroom versus a two bedroom? That all come uh, depends on money. If you got the money, go for a bigger uh, apartment. Absolutely, but most often uh, uh, money is the driving factor. Well, uh, but that that's a family choice, not really a therapeutic uh, choice. Got a question right here. Good morning. My name is John Brandon, and my wife is June Brandon, and I'm the caregiver for her. I did what you did, told us not to do. When I was doing my research, I put my email on the internet. And I've got a lot of calls from different assisted living programs. So I'm at the stage now where I'm the only caregiver. Our children live out of town. And my wife is from Barbados. And a lot of her siblings are in Barbados in London. I'm at the stage now where I'm starting to feel it. I do have her in a adult care program uh, with aging. And I take it twice a week. And it's very helpful. We, we love it. She loves it. But I'm starting to feel the impact of being a caregiver. So when I said I put my uh, information on the internet, I get a lot of calls. And I feel as though they're kind of rushing me to get my wife into the center, in, uh, assisted living programs. 
And I'm telling them, well, I'm not quite ready for that right now. She's not at that point. But then as time goes on, I see her going through different stages, uh, physical stages, uh, speech stages, and I'm rethinking it. I'm, I'm at the point right now where I'm, I'm going to seek and reach out to my in-laws for help, maybe assistance to try to get to a finance, maybe one of these programs you're talking about. Also, um, last week I heard on the news they're doing investigations to some daycare centers, nursing homes, and they're not getting this and they're not getting good service to the patients. And that kind of kind of uh, put in my mind is it, you know is a good idea to put them into nursing homes where they're not getting good services. So I like to hear that from you. Which, what, speak about that to me about those services and those nursing centers. I would say that BC and I uh, both have our own opinions on that. In general, I think that the caregiving that goes on in uh, Medicaid and nursing homes is grim um, and can't really compare to what you get in the assisted living. But it's certainly better than the alternative. And it's great that we have some sort of government safety net. Um, there are good nursing homes and less good nursing homes. It frustrates me that I can't always keep up with who's good and who's bad because it depends on when the director of nursing changes and when the executive director changes. And some place that I liked six months ago would be completely different today. Uh, and, it, it, uh, and one thing everybody has to recognize, caregiving is a difficult uh, job and people are underpaid and people move around all the time. And it may not even matter who your executive director is, it may matter who your caregiver is. And you don't always know who that's going to be. So there's some randomness as to what goes on. So can uh, abuses happen? Yes, they're rare. That's where uh, the executive director matters though, because good management really sets the tone. But when you find an angel of a caregiver is working there, it makes all the difference. Um, so, but, but that's true even in assisted living or memory care. Uh, you can't always tell who's on the night shift. And when you go in and you talk to a, uh, a, a, mark, a marketing person, a director of marketing, you know, they're going to tell you that things are good and they mean it sincerely and they're good people. But there are times when there is a good oversight and you know, there's three different ships and you're not sure what's going on in the ship. There is some random mistakes like that, for sure. You see, you want to mention? Yes, you do have regulatory um, agencies that are in charge of the licensing of all of the, uh, the care centers, whether it's a private bay or whether it's a skilled nursing facility. And uh, I always think um, that you need to have some concept of what your expectations are so that you won't be disappointed in the care. Because if you go in thinking they're going to give mom a shower twice a day, you know, that's unrealistic. They're not going to do that. So make a list of what your expectations are. And when you go there, ask them if that's realistic or if they can meet those expectations and uh, and then follow up on it you know they have meetings with you periodically and you can uh, check all the boxes and see they don't they don't close you out uh, you know in during COVID you did get closed out but right now you're not closed out. You can drop in anytime. You can go back for breakfast and see if mom's actually eating or someone needs to help her. You know, you are you have options and, and your oversight is incredibly important. You're gonna notice things that no one else does. So I say just be active, uh, you know, go there. And, and just like in, with any caregiver, you know, you're going to get the warm, fuzzy feeling when you get in the right place. You're going to know you're there. And I can say this from experience because I found a memory care for my mom on the phone talking with 
their uh, she was actually their marketing director, but she had been a nursing home administrator for very for many years. And so when I was asking the questions by phone, uh, she asked me if I was in the industry. And I said, well, so what? And she said, because you're asking all the questions that people ask that work in the business. And I said, well, I've never been in direct care, but I do, you know, I'm in and out of places all the time. And, uh, and she, you know, the things that she told me made me feel secure. So when I showed up over there, it was just as she said it was. It was it was the perfect place, and unfortunately, my mom never needed care until she was ninety nine, and it was kind of hard for us to adjust to her ever going to someone for care. But she had a hip fracture, she got an anesthetic when she had the surgery, and she lost blood memory was left, and she was frightened to stay at home, so we didn't have an option. And, uh, you know, we got there. Everything wasn't perfect all the time, but we talked about it and we fixed it. We fixed what, our, uh, what we anticipated was the good care for our mom versus what care she was getting. And, you know, it, it just was wonderful, I thought. Uh, you know, my sister dropped in more often because she was in the area, but our mom was happy. Uh, she felt secure. And, and, you know, she was with people all the time. She actually had better interaction than she did living alone because she got lonely alone. And unfortunately, she had that fall that precipitated, you know, her having to be there. But she was happy and they were wonderful to her. And you also have got an ally with one of our agencies that's here uh, with tabling, and that is the Area Agency on Aging. If you're not familiar with them, they're the pass-through money of the Older Americans Act. So every major city has an area agency on aging. Ours here of the capital area serves eight counties. One of the programs they have it is, is an ombudsman's program specifically for the long-term care communities. So it is us, the consumer, that they will go on our behalf as a federal agency and help you with whatever is happening in the community. And that is absolutely free because you paid part of your tax money. So visit with them and they can give you more information on that. BC, we've got a question from someone online asking about the veterans benefits. Does the aid and attendance or any of those programs also help with the spouse or the dependent? Yes, there are both uh, options. Uh, if you have a dependent child, uh, they possibly can benefit from the aid in attendance. And also there are, um, if, if you have two veterans, which are the husband and wife, you get a larger benefit. But typically the wife gets the benefit or the spouse when they're widowed. There is a, a benefit amount for the uh, widow or widower. And there's also a dependent uh, child amount as well. It's not listed here, but if there is a, a dependent amount as well. And considering that it is a state-specific, well, the, no, that was a federal program. Federal. Federal program. <laughs> but again, like all of these things, it's best to talk with an expert to help you sift through it, because if you try to go look it up online, you're going to get four or five different answers. Or even better, if you call five different times, you're going to get five different <laughs> answers. So let's look at the rules. <laughs> We've got a question about long-term care insurance and what it typically covers in terms of retirement communities. Does it ever cover any of the costs of independent living? such as you talk about the buy-in in some place like uh, Westminster or Corinthia. Does it ever cover any of those types of costs? And what does it usually cover in terms of assisted or skilled living? So the first caveat to that question is that it is always uh, dependent on the long-term care contract. There are no uh, generic contracts. Everyone is different. 
and there has been uh, an evolution in the industry as well. Older contracts often uh, lasted longer, but they also covered more narrow things. So the older contracts that used to say that you had to have 24 seven nursing, uh, which would uh, make the independent, uh, independent assistant them and take that out of the equation sometimes. Uh, the older contracts go on indefinitely. The newer contracts will go two, three, or five years and be capped because the insurance companies ran out of money and realized they were underpricing their products, and so they changed them. Uh, Long-term care insurance pretty much never covers independent living uh, room and board. It will often cover the home care in independent living, just as it would at home, but it will not cover room and board. Uh, Long-term care insurance generally will cover assisted living and generally will cover uh, and almost always cover uh, uh, memory care. Usually in long-term care insurance, the caveat is you have to have two, require two out of six activities of daily living to qualify. More commonly in more recent policies, there's also a, uh, a, a codicil for severe cognitive decline. In, uh, instead of two out of six activities a day of living. Um, Long-term care insurance, when you want to talk about it, you basically have to bring your contract and show it to somebody because they're always different. It's a contract. It's whatever's in the four corners of the contract. You can go on about all sorts of different uh, possibilities of what's in there, but you're going to have to look at your policy specifically. Got a question right here. Hi, um, the gentleman's question over here about the quality of care in nursing home and assisted living made me think, um, what kind of tools for advocacy do care uh, givers have that are immediate if they see signs of neglect or abuse? Um, I know you mentioned the um, ombudsman program, but who, who can caregivers reach out to if they're experiencing um, some, some concerns, their um, care receivers' health? So as VC said, I think it's really important having had my dad in um, assisted living skills and memory care at different times. I think it's super important that you are there and you are an advocate and they are going to be more um, aware if you're there a lot. So that I think is the first line of defense is that you're present. Um, the second thing I think you do in any community, um, I, I have to having then on both sides, I would say this is hard for the people caring for our loved ones, right? So we have to, there, I know a lot of people, I experienced a lot of families who were really hot-headed when something went wrong with care. And I think it's important to ask questions first. And if, let's say they're in assisted living, you, you're partnering with these people, right? You're partnering with them. You want them to provide good care. So if you're a good partner, they're going to be a good partner. So the first thing is to go to them and to see, to say, you know, this happened. I'm very concerned. Um, how can we fix this? Now, obviously, there's a gamut of what happens. There are things that I would consider egregious that you actually have to report to the state. So that's a whole different thing. But I think generally in this room, you're, what you're going to be working with is people that you can partner with they're going to partner well with you and they're going to appreciate partnership they they need the support if you tell them thank you you bring them cookies um sorry it may seem like a bribe but my gosh they're working really hard i was just amazed at what the caregivers did for my own father i thought oh my gosh who does who chooses this as a career it's hard so as much as you can stand in their shoes and try and partner with them if it is egregious, yes, there's the ombudsman, there's reporting to the state, you know, you have to, but you have to go through the channels. And I would say I've seen that rarely. I, I think um, I worked when I was in my position at Halcyon with a ton of different communities. Um, I, you know, we have Shauna here from Arden Courts who will speak in a little bit. I'm sure she'll tell you the same thing is that they want you to be a partner. They want the communication. If they're defensive initially, just make sure you're going in calm and you're being a good advocate and you're being a kind person. And I think that's going to help. Uh, so if y'all want to talk about it going to a higher level, it hasn't very much in my
almost never have I seen it be effective to go to a, a regulator. It takes too long. Adult Protective Services is a fabulous organization, and they're way underfunded and understaffed, and that usually takes weeks. So Donna's point is, uh, is true. 99% at least of the time when there's a problem, it's going to be between you and the management that you're going to have to deal with. Regulators are, uh, have great intentions, but they're not going to be around, and they're not going to be around on a basis. The other thing to understand is that there is something I like to make a distinction between unacceptable and unforgivable. There will be a lot of unacceptable things that happen. It's unacceptable for somebody to take a fall, but you can't do one-on-one -on -one care. There will be human mistakes, uh, an occasional medication error. Again, unacceptable but forgivable. There are some things that are not forgivable. Abuse is never forgivable. Neglect is never forgivable. Things uh, like that. And so VCs could comment about earlier about expectation management is important uh, because you know, what they say is uh, expectations are self-made resentments. You need to understand what's going to happen in place. You're gonna, you also have to remember, this is not one-on-one -on -one care. You get one-on-one -on -one care at home, and there's uh, and that's great. And there are trade-offs to anything to do, as I said before. You can also speaking of the one-on-one -on -one care coming from the care side, people would often say to me, "Okay, we're going to move mom to assisted living. Ooh, we're going to get rid of these costs." And I can tell you, when my dad was in memory care, he forgot he couldn't stand up. We'd put him in a wheelchair because, being a long-time runner, his knees were shot. I had to hire eight hours of care a day. So they were there standing and he they turned their head for a second and he'd fall out of the chair and be on the floor and they're like we're going to send him to the hospital every time so they are they will ask to have care so you could have caregivers which is a horrifying thought since we're talking about money right and you have to add that and so um so that's important to remember and yes it's not one-on-one -on -one care unless you add a caregiver on top of it but i want to say working with a lot of different communities Rarely have I come across a community that did not want to work with families if they have a caregiver who does something wrong and you catch them, which we it happens, that community is not going to talk. They will fire that person. So they will let them go. So they have your best interests at heart. We've got about eight minutes left on our session. So we're going to grab two more questions very quickly. I such a wealth of information and uh, so many questions that uh, I have come across over these years. I've been doing uh, remote care with my mother for nine years. So I've seen a lot of it and I, I just wanted to mention uh, for a couple of people um, uh, that talked about confidence of a uh, loved one and that medical confidence is not the same as legal confidence. And that's probably why your colleague asks questions in the moment to determine if they have legal confidence at the moment of signing a document. And so that might be helpful in them um, trying to get to that. And then in the, I'm sorry, I'll get to my question. In, in the uh, guardianship, the other thing that I learned was important is that if you have a sibling or anyone who questions the guardianship, it could go to a third party. So it's not something that you want to consider very lightly. And then um, nursing homes and the, the difference between them, uh, it really does determine, I mean, it really is dependent on the caregivers and the people running that. And I will say that one of my experiences has been that those that are um, abiding by state regulations um, tend to be able um, in, in my opinion, if, if you can determine that they're abiding by those and they have um, uh, a heartfelt, um, uh, I lost the word, <laughs> see, I, I may end up there. <laughs> um, but if abiding by those regulations sometimes uh, helps you feel confident in the care that they're going to receive, especially if they um, are doing that from the heart. And then uh, my question, sorry, maybe for you, um, so I've been doing this for nine years, right? And I'm still learning every day. I still feel like I'm uh, 
brand new to this every single day. And I'm just curious if there's anything um, in our required curriculums in our education system that's helping prepare our future generations for dealing with this, especially given the increasing number of people um, that are developing dementia. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> you know, we learn how to balance a checkbook when we're in school. We learn how to sew a button. No one ever teaches us how to care for another person. And so, unfortunately, you know, that's something that we're not teaching people. Uh, organizations like Age of Central Texas are here to fill that gap. So are wonderful programs like the ones that happen here at the church the, with the lighthouse that helps provide that kind of care. Uh, organizations like the Area Agency on Aging that provides caregiver education. So unfortunately, we are not training our next generation to be able to care for us. And we are going to be the largest population on the face of the earth of older adults. Here in Central Texas, we have the second largest population of older adults, 65 and older, and the largest in pre-retirement, the, the 50 to 64. You put those two together for the next 40 years, there are more older adults in Central Texas than there are children. There are currently more older adults age 80 and over than there are children five and younger. So we think of Austin as being a young city, but the reality is there are more older adults here than there are children. And that's the way it's going to be quite some time. And that's not just Austin, that's global. So we're kind of slow to catch up to the reality of where we are, unfortunately. Um, my question is, and I also have a comment about something, but I'll ask the question first. But um, do you have age have that, like you, you were talking about a list of questions that we should ask. If you being an expert knew exactly what to ask when you're researching facilities. Oh, this is for BC. But I also want to, can I just say this first? Um, one thing that has given me a lot of reassurance about having, putting my mother in a facility and it would be a Medicaid bed in a skilled nursing facility is that they have 24 seven access and you can have a camera that you can look at. Um, I think that each individual has their own specific needs that they're looking for for their family members. Because my mom, uh, you know, she was one of these busy, creative people that always entertained herself so much. And but then she sort of changed once she had the memory loss and became anxious and unsure. So she needed, she had different needs then. She needed familiar, familiarity, plus she needed someone um, that could kind of understand because she sort of lost her language skills. You know, they would have little mind teaser uh, groups and they would ask questions. And my mom would know the answer, but she would say, no, it's what he said. <laughs> But I think, I think through, uh, and, and we did have a camera in my mom's room and uh, she was, she was, because of her memory, you have to keep in mind, they don't remember to press the button when they need help. They, they, our mom didn't. And, uh, you know, you have to take that into consideration because they will get out of bed without help or whatever because of their memory loss. But uh, we had a camera in my mom's room, and when she broke her other hip, she was standing there. She remembered to have her walker, and she was standing still. And what we realized was that her other hip broke, and mom fell. But she was that uh, this particular uh, memory care had the neatest idea. It was like half doors, and she could keep the bottom half closed. So she felt secure, but they could still walk by and see that she was okay in there, or they could hear her calls for help. And that's exactly what we had to rely on because she couldn't remember about the button or anything. So I, I think in every situation, it's different, you know, kind of observe what you're doing now and, and look at what, what you want. And, and let me tell you, making a batch of cookies makes all the difference in the world. 
having a few little gift cards, taking a platter of, of fresh fruit. And you know, that's such a small price to pay for anyone caring for my mom. BC, we have one last question, and you had mentioned uh, irrevocable trust. Can you very quickly, because we've only got about three minutes left, explain what that is, and then approximately how much does it cost for an attorney to draw that up for someone? Um, an irrevocable trust is where you take the assets actually out of the hands of the individual, whether it be a couple or an individual, and you place it in this trust that has a trustee. And the trustee has total control over everything. And usually you have at least two backups for that trustee in the event that they need to take some kind of action. And, you know, the trustees in Europe, then you have backups on there that can still continue the trust and you actually resort to a financial institution as if everyone didn't, and the last, the trust lasted longer than the trustees, then you still have the bank that can continue that trust and so that it doesn't fail. Um, I think that we, we charge flat fees for all, everything in our office there. And we typically charge a flat rate of $5,000 for a trust, but that comes with a, a whole lot more than just a stack of papers because Keith goes through that trust with you, the family members, anybody that wants to understand about it, you show up because you find out exactly the stipulations of that trust and what it does and what it does not do. Just like if you get a will or a power of attorney, you're going to walk out of there knowing exactly what you're getting with these documents. And I've worked for a lot of attorneys that did not do that. But let rest assured that you will have all your questions answered and you will be confident with whatever you have. There's a, a great variation in cost, though, and I think we're way on the low side, but we're not real materialistic there anyway. So for the folks that had other questions, I apologize that we have run out of time, but remember that they're all going to be here, that you can pop over here and visit with them during lunch or after the sessions. For our folks who are online joining us, we are going to answer your questions that you sent us because some of them our folks could not answer here. So we are saving the chat and we are going to have someone answer your questions personally for that. Also, for everyone here and online, since we have your email addresses from the registration, we're going to send you all the slides for today. We're also going to send you links to the recordings that we are making of the sessions. We're going to send you all of that stuff. So we're going to send you lots of good stuff. So don't worry about that. You had to write everything down. So we're going to take care of that. I want to say thank you so much to Donna and to Mike and to VC for being here for the next few days this morning. You guys are having us. And we so appreciate it.